most of the part of the talk will be in a, in that where I will write in that virtual board, and some part of the talk at the beginning, just the some introduction will be in this presentation. So I, I couldn't get much time to prepare a lot of slides. So there are very few slides, only ten, and then a part of it I will just write. Okay, I can start, right? Yes, you are going to start. Okay. So today, what we will discuss is mostly the critical dynamics. So now the critical dynamics is a lot of things. So I I couldn't first figure out that where to start and where to end. So here is more or less the plan. So first, I will talk about what is phase transitions and critical phenomena, and then I will talk about the static critical exponents. So mostly introducing the phase transitions and so on. And then I will go to the critical dynamics. And for introducing dynamics, I will talk about master equation. So what is master equation? And then I will give one example of dynamical critical exponent. So just like the static critical exponents, there are a number of dynamical critical exponents. So and um, and then I will introduce all different kind of uh, uh, critical dynamics, the examples of that. And for that, I will talk about scaling behavior. And this scaling behavior is mostly for the critical phenomena where the dynamics is involved. And now, for some specific reasons, we need to we cannot calculate the critical temperature properly. And a very nice way to calculate the critical temperature is Binder cumulant. So I will talk about Binder cumulant. And at the end, I'm not sure, but maybe we will just talk about what is non-equilibrium phase transitions and other stuff. Okay. So let's start. So we have the phase transitions. So there are two kind of phase transitions mostly. One is the first order phase transition. One of the example is the solid to liquid and liquid to gas transition. And there are uh, second order phase transition where the second order phase transition we call the continuous phase transition for some reason. So the first order for the first order phase transition, the basic thermodynamic definition of first order phase transition is that the first order derivative of the free energy with respect to the phase transitional parameter will discontinue. And the second order derivative will be continuous and so on. So that's the first order uh, phase transition. The example is the solid liquid to gas. For second order phase transition or continuous phase transition, the definition, thermodynamic definition is exactly following the same line that the second order derivative of the free energy with respect to the phase transitional parameter will diverge. And um, and then the higher order will sustain. So if the second order derivative is continuous, but the first third order derivative diverges, we will still call it a continuous phase transition. So after the first order phase transition, everything fall in the group of continuous phase transition. One of the example of this continuous phase transition is um, ferromagnetic to paramagnetic, paramagnetic to ferromagnetic, or the ferromagnetic to paramagnetic phase transition. Now, why it called? Let me just give you some example that why it called continuous phase transition. To understand phase transition, we have we need something called order parameter. So, order parameter is something which will change suddenly from one phase around the phase transitional point from one phase to another. So, it will change suddenly. Okay. In continuous phase transition, to determine the order parameter is must is much simpler than determining the order parameter in the first order phase transition. So first order phase transition uh, is more complicated or we have less understanding about the first order phase transition. One of the example of the order parameter of the first order phase transition for liquid to gas transition is rho L minus rho C, where rho L is the density of the liquid and rho C is the density of that fluid at the critical temperature. So you see that you need to know the critical temperature or you, you need to know the critical point to define the order parameter properly, which is which makes things a bit complicated. Whereas in case of magnetic phase transition, you simply have the magnetization as an order parameter, which actually give you one at ferromagnetic stage and give you zero at the paramagnetic stage. Okay, so that's why this defining this order parameter for the continuous phase transition is simpler than the most of the times than the first. Doctor, phase yes, please. Uh, Thomas wants to ask you something. Yes. Yeah, one please. question. Um, <clears throat> the order parameter is a thermodynamical variable, right? 
Yes, yes. So it should be just the density of your system, not really, um, say, the uh, theoretical. You introduced Rho sub L and Rho sub C as if they were, say, uh, a priori known per constants. But that's not, right? It's a uh, Rho. It's really Rho, the thermodynamical Rho as a Yes, the thermodynamic Rho. So, yeah, it Rho is from Rho L to Rho C, say. So I didn't get so Rho L is the density of the liquid. Okay. But is it and now is, it, uh, is it a variable or is it a constant you know beforehand? Uh, okay, so in for the theoretically it's a constant. So it will the density of the liquid it, it, it will change with the temperature, but it will change so low that I can take it as a constant. I mean but uh, you see the free energy should depend on rho, right? Otherwise, you cannot take the derivative. No, rho, rho is my order parameter. My Here, what I am talking oh, about it's, it's is the temperature is my thermodynamic parameter. So I'm looking at the phase transition with respect to temperature. Or you can one can look at the with respect to pressure also. So rho is my order parameter. So looking at which I will understand that the phase transition is happening or not. But then, then I'm confused. I mean, you see, you have the free energy. You take a derivative with respect to what? With respect to temperature. But then you get the, what do you get? You get the energy, right? You get the internal energy or something. Yeah, so, so OK. Let me just re give the definition. The definition is that if, the, OK, if I talk about, OK, I am telling you that the phase transition with respect to that phase transitional parameter. So here, uh, let's consider that, that as a temperature. So, so if I consider del F del T, okay, F is a free energy mm -hmm. that could be del G del T or del F del T depending on the system. Yes. So if I have del F, uh, for example, in case of con uh, mm -hmm. second order phase transition, del 2F del T square, that diverges. Del F del T remain continuous. No, in no, case let, of let's, this see, phase, let's say the first order phase transition. Yeah, I'm the kind of, yeah, first but order phase transition. You, so where do where so do the density then enter? Okay, I, I'm telling you. So the phase transition for free energy that is del F del T or del G del T that diverges, and there that that how the phase transition is defined. Or well, first order first that that's why thermodynamically it's called the first order phase transition. Now, for each phase transition, I define a new thing, which we call order parameter. OK, so this order parameter, it's a new thermodynamic quantity, which is not free energy. And looking at this and in the order parameter, that will be definition of the order parameter is the in the order state, it will be one or close to one in a very high value or once normalized is close to one. And in the disordered phase or in the other other phase, it will be close to zero. So that we have to define something like that. And then the whole phase transition, we will study with respect to some thermodynamic quantities. And that's not free energy. Free energy is, is a thermodynamic definition. Statistical in, in the, from the statistical physics point of view, we will look at many other quantities. And one of the most important quantity we will look at is the order parameter, which is in case of magnetic transition is magnetization. And in case of this first order transition, solid to liquid to li and liquid to gas transition, that is the density. Oh, OK, OK. Thanks. Next slide. Now I define something called, OK, now there is something called critical exponent and universality. What's that? So let's go to this slide slowly. So let me first define something called reduced temperature. OK, so from now on, all the phase transition I will talk about, I will talk about with respect to the temperature. Now, let, first let me define something called reduced temperature. The reduced temperature at the top, it's written, let's call it small t. That is t minus Tc by Tc. I put the mod there. Usual in the usual definition, people do not put mod. So you can have the reduced temperature actually positive and negative both. So I defined it in that way. OK. So that's the reduced temperature, which is basically normalized between. So it actually tell you that how far you are from the critical temperature. That's the reduced temperature. Now, 
we now so instead of studying the phase transition with respect to temperature i will study the phase transition with respect to reduced temperature okay now so all this thermodynamic quantities whatever i will study i will study with respect to this reduced temperature and in case of ferromagnetic to paramagnetic phase transition i have for a magnetic system i have another quantity that is magnetic field so i have two things one a paramagnetic system going to the ferromagnetic system with respect to the temperature and i put a field and which suddenly go from paramagnetic to ferromagnetic and that's the first order phase transition by the way so uh, so with respect now the question is that this order parameter that diverges okay that suddenly go from 1 to 0 so that have a that doesn't diverge but that have a discontinuity the order parameter now the second thing which is the susceptibility psi that's actually susceptibility actually is the second order derivative of some free energies and that diverges so now the and there is also with respect to field that is the specific heat with respect to the constant magnetic field that also diverges because that also specific heat, heat is also the second order derivative of a free energy now the question is that okay this diverges what the question we ask here that how do they diverge okay so they diverge in close to the critical point close to the crit critical point with where the reduced temperature temperature is close to zero at that point they diverges in a power law fashion power law fashion and that give me a exponent so for example this magnetization that goes as t to the power beta when t not equal to tc of course and that beta value of this beta is 0 0.33 the funny thing or the interesting thing is that for all this all these quantities susceptibility um, uh, um, specific heat magnetization everything that all these exponents they are universal the values of these things are so universal that if you talk about the magnetic system any magnetic system you take the values of this ex critical exponent doesn't change so for a model for example for a model if you take an ising model or you take a nearest neighbor ising model or a next nearest neighbor ising model unless and until you take a very long range interaction which changes the magnetic system completely Okay, if you take a nearest neighbor Ising model or next nearest neighbor Ising model, all these short range interaction Ising model that will give you, theoretically give you the same value of these exponents. Okay, it doesn't end there. It is so universal that even the order of phase transition changes of these values. Okay, I carefully picked up only these three exponents, which values doesn't even change if, if the order of phase transition changes. So is that universal? For example, if I go to this gas to liquid, this rho L minus rho C, that also goes as t to the power beta. And there also, experimentally, you can find out that the beta is 0.33 for a gas to liquid and most of the gas to liquid phase transitions. Okay. Similarly, for if I look at the xi, that goes as t to the power minus gamma, gamma is 1.33. And now, if you go from paramagnetic to ferromagnetic, you can calculate a gamma. You can go from ferromagnetic to paramagnetic. You can calculate this gamma dash. Let's call it gamma dash. Both this gamma and gamma dash is same. Both is one point close to 1.33. And similarly, I can for a gas and to liquid, I can define something which is called isothermal compressibility, which is del rho del p with con constant temperature. Okay, this isothermal compressibility that also diverges in a similar fashion with the similar exponent gamma. Similar exponent means it have an it uh, diverges with an exponent gamma, with some exponent and the value of the exponent is same 1.33. Okay, now if I look at the uh, something different. Okay, so I'm talking about this is with respect to phase transition. Now let's let me give a magnetic field. So this then the order parameter with respect to that magnetic field that diverges as h to the power one by delta, and that's at the critical temperature at the critical temperature. And this H is the reduced magnetic field, reduced field. It's not the pure field. So the definition is beta mu H. Okay. And that delta is 4. And similarly, I look at for the gas to liquid, I look at with respect to pressure. So rho L minus rho C, which proportional to PL, uh, P minus PL. And that also Dr. goes as a 1. Dr. Yes, Dr. please. Yes. Yeah, I want to ask something. Yes, sure. Yes, just, uh, just I have one question. Uh, you say that in this case, 
that beta in ferromagnetic to paramagnetic and that got to liquid, this uh, beta has the same value and also the gamma, right? If you try to define all these things, they have the... No, no, the no, no. what I'm saying, for example, gamma, if you go yeah. to ferromagnetic to paramagnetic for, for beta, gamma, both, if you go from ferromagnetic to paramagnetic or paramagnetic to ferromagnetic, in both cases, if you calculate how these quantities are diverging, and if you calculate that, you will get the same value. Okay. Okay. I mean, and now okay. if I look at the gas gas liquid, I can define similar some kind of quantities. For, for example, for gas to liquid, I mean, order parameter is well defined. And mm -hmm. there you can also get a beta, an exponent, and that exponent for the gas to liquid, which is first order phase transition, and permanently to paramagnetic, which is second order phase transition, both is same. Okay. Yes. Just my is question. Is, my question is: so this means that these two systems have some common values? Exactly. Or some co common val common mm -hmm. properties and yes. close to critical te temperature. Close okay. Critical so this this and that's so, called the universality. So it's like two systems are related in some way, or one Not property really. of the other is similar to. Not really. Okay. What I can okay, I, I'm coming. I, I will come to that. Uh, so there is something okay. There is some some way related through which is actually mm -hmm. correlation length. So the correlation length for close to the critical temperature diverges in the similar way. Okay. Okay, both cases it diverges, and both cases it diverges in the similar way. So I'm coming to that, but I'm just going uh, according to the historical development. What okay. people first noticed and what make them surprised that there are critical exponents, which is close to the critical point, and the value of this critical exponent are universal. So at the beginning, you will it is not obvious that if you go from one phase to another, the critical if the critical exponent you calculate will be same as if you go from an okay, phase A to phase B and phase B to phase A. In both cases, this critical value of this critical exponent will be exactly the same. That's also not obvious. And there are examples, which is actually costalis thaulis phase transition, where it is not. Okay. And that's why that phase transition at the beginning is called three by two order phase transition, because in one way, it looked like first order. In another way, it looked like second order. And now the looking at the critical exponent, you really couldn't distinguish it, because most of the all these critical exponents of this slide, they are similar, but there are some other things. So okay. this critical exponent in both ways will be similar. That's not very obvious. That's the first point. And the second point is that you take cobalt, cobalt or a nickel or iron, in both cases, experimentally, you can find out this beta and gamma, and they're similar. They're same value. Okay. If you and change the material, mag magnetic material, they, these critical exponents, they do not change. Okay, and just, I have another question. Um, well, now we know that these two, in these cases, for example, the gamma value is similar in, in both systems. If you look at some specific uh, uh, observables, right? Mm -hmm. This is because right now we have the theory and we can explain these kind of things or it was known or it was expected that these two systems has to be related or somehow and when they develop, for example, the isothermal compressibility, they will expect it to have a... Uh, no, no, no. In the beginning, in this slide, mm -hmm. yes, in this slide, what I am talking is just the first the observations. What people, mm -hmm. they, people, first, people first observe this and then they... That hunch went for more than 50 years to understand, and still it's going on to understand mm -hmm. for different kind of estimations for the different critical exponents. So the first thing come by observation. For this slide, what I am telling you is the experimental observations. And then there are simulational observations also. Okay. okay. So first the observation come and then the theory in this specific case. Anything else? No, thank you so much. Please continue. Okay. OK, so now um, as psi um, diverges, we also know that the um, specific heat also diverges. So specific heat CH that diverges as t to the power minus alpha. And alpha is 0 0.01. And then for the gas to liquid, we have our obvious uh, specific heat is specific heat at constant volume, CV. And that also, and that's a very nice connection that CV and CH both diverges in the similar fashion. So I can call it, it alpha or anything, but the whole issue is that they both diverges in the similar fashion. And if I just look at the second order phase transition or the continuous phase transition, experimentally what we have seen that if you change the magnetic material, as a long it will remain a ferromagnetic material, this exponent doesn't change experimentally. And um, theoretically, I can say that if you take a, a model, which is say uh, 
where the symmetries doesn't change for example ising model and you take a nearest neighbor ising model or next nearest neighbor ising model and next to next nearest neighbor ising model all these cases you can calculate and this critical exponent remains same is that universal okay so we so we know now that what is the reduced temperature what is reduced field and this critical exponent which is beta gamma delta and alpha and now this exponents satisfy a number of inequality okay so one of this inequality which is called roos bloch inequality which is alpha plus 2 beta plus gamma is greater than or equal to 2 okay there are something called uh, there are other inequalities also which is written in the second one the alpha plus beta into 1 minus delta 1 plus delta greater than or equal to 2 that come from the com convexity property of the free energy so uh, so basically this 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 you can the second inequality you can actually compute from using fifor theory so that there you have get this 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 convexity property of the free energy you use where this odd numbers uh, odd powers uh, of this free energy they go to zero and so on so that that come from the fifor theory okay for from the field theories and there are other inequalities which is also universal we have noticed this this inequalities not only this values of the exponent are universal also this this inequalities are also universal okay so after that after this slide sorry now what i want to talk about is called something called scaling laws so we have this inequalities we can say uh, sorry we have this critical exponent and we can say that this critical exponent scale like that and now what is the scaling laws in general so what is the finite size scaling what is the critical scaling so i will first talk about the critical scaling okay the scaling of the these parameters close to the critical phenomenon so for that let's go to some uh, some uh, some mathematical formations so let's call fxy which is a generalized homogeneous function okay i guess everybody know what is generalized homogeneous function so the definition of this generalized homogeneous function is just given here so if a function which is lambda to the power a into x and lambda to the power b into y if i can write that function as lambda into fxy where a and b are two arbitrary numbers and of course the lambda is a parameter and it's also an arbitrary parameter then this function we will call is a generalized homogeneous function okay now as this parameter lambda is arbitrary so i can take it any expression right so let's choose this expression to be 1 by x to the power 1 by a and now put it in equation 1 in the previous equation then if i just put it then the first term of that equation become uh, of that function become 1 okay and the second term become y by um, x to the power b by a okay and then then it become a function of uh, 1 into the okay i can just define it's a, another function of y by x to the power b by a and now i can just from the definition of that uh, there's a dif different function so from the definition of uh, homogeneous function i can write that is 1 by 1 by 1 by x, no, x to the power 1 by a into fx uh, fxy okay so that give me that fxy which is x to the power 1 by a into function of uh, f of y by x to the power b by a so that what that f big f is a another scaling function so this this formation is just from the generalized homogeneous function and this generalized homogeneous function for the field theory what we usually use this function for the free energies and now so so that's why i wrote that so now if i say for a magnetic transition that my if i just put a, instead of x is equal to t which is t is the reduced temperature and y is equal to h where h is a reduced magnetic field then the free energy i can just write that f of um, lambda to the power a into t into lambda to the power b into h that give me lambda of f th so this whole thing so precisely this free energy is a homogeneous generalized homogeneous function of reduced temperature and magnetic field reduced field okay now let me look at this scaling variable which is fz so what i have defined just there in the previous slide which is f or y by x to the power b by a which actually 
H by T to the power B by A. B and A, A and B are two arbitrary numbers. So if I just take this scaled homogeneous free energy function Fz, which is actually Fxy by x to the power 1 by A, and now I can just scale this variable, okay, this Z, which is Y by x to the power B by A. So now I have this scaled function, scaled free energy function, and I have a scaled variable, okay. So now if I plot Fz versus Z for different values of x, x and y, that means in for different values of reduced temperature and reduced field, if I plot this free energy function, then plotting the scaled variable, plotting the scaled function with the scaled variable, that will collapse in a single curve. And all this collapse, this, this collapse is called data collapse. So precisely what I am doing is taking what for this um, for this data class what i am taking that i am taking the different parameter values of the different reduced temperature and different reduced field and then the plot and then then i scale with this uh, reduced temperature and reduced field I, ha I have a scaled reduced temperature and a scaled reduced field and then i have a scaled free energy function and then i plot them and then they then they fall in the top of, fall on the top of each other and that's one of the first example of the data collapse, okay? And that's what the scaling is, okay? That, that can give you successfully the data collapse one. Now, this is all about, still now, about the free energy functions. Now, if I talk about, I can use the same thing for the magnetic transition, right? So I can just define these magnetic transitions instead of these eight functions. So for the magnetic transition, now I have to scale the magnetization. So I have a scaling function of magnetization, which is the function of T and H. Okay, the magnetization is a function of reduced temperature and reduced magnetic field. And that gives me, and that I can scale it as T to the power beta. Beta is the same beta what we have seen before. And a, and a scaled magnetization, which is bold M, which is plus minus one, just like following the previous slide into H into T to the power minus beta delta. Okay, so my scaled magnetization then become the normal magnetization divided by T to the power beta. And my scaled magnetic field become the normal reduced magnetic field multiplied by T to the power minus beta delta. Okay, so now if for the magnetization also, so the my scaled magnetization becomes, okay, uh, this M, this just a function plus minus one and of, of, of scaled magnetic field. So now I can also um, uh, obtain a data collapse, which can be obtained for all values of temperature. Okay, close to Tc, T greater than Tc and T less than Tc in both cases, but close to the critical temperature because my reduced temperature, such that my reduced temperature is no value of the reduced temperature is not very high. And my value of the reduced field is not also very high. So that's how we do it. So that's the scale temperature. Okay, that's the, and then I plot um, this scaled magnetization with the scaled magnetic field for different values of T, and then all, and then all these different values of T, they fall on the top of each other, all these curves fall on the top of each other, and that can give me a data collapse. Okay. So, so it, it's just like, a, okay, um, I didn't have, I do not have this um, plot here, so it just looked like an hysteresis plot. So if you just do the hysteresis plot of magnetization, and then in that magnetization of hysteresis plot, okay, you can just take different values of T, uh, which give you different hysteresis curve, and then you plot with the scale magnetization with scale magnetic field, all these hysteresis curve, curve, curve will fall on the top of each other, and that, that's the data collapse you can obtain there. Okay, so now, Now all these things, what I'm talking about, this critical exponent for, uh, there are field theories for that, and then I have this scaling laws and so on. So now the question is that, how can I theoretically calculate this exponents? That's the question it comes. So of course, to theoretically calculate this, I have to do some simulation, right? So there is a underlying dynamics going on, which changes from one to another, and that dynamics we have to understand, and that is the dynamics which will, which I, which we have to perform if we want to do the simulation. And now, 
if my temperature t is greater than tc then that dynamics we call supercritical dynamics if t is less than tc we call it subcritical dynamics and critical dynamics is when t is equal to tc okay so when t is equal to tc then we call at the critical temperature we call the critical dynamics now for defining or finding out the critical temperature exactly is bit complicated so the dynamics around this critical temperature where the t is very close to tc we will call that as critical dynamics okay so from there i will go i will just leave this slide now and i will go to the to the sorry to my notebook of critical dynamics so before knowing the critical dynamics i have i will talk about something called important sampling okay can everybody see this this what i am going to write yes yes okay 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 thank you so let's define some um, some parameters let's call it a okay so if i have a so what is my uh, what is the average of a so average of a is not simply 1 by a okay 1 by n and sum over uh, sum over i a i so if i write, want to write this average of a statistical mechanically properly that will be 1 by z z is my partition function and sum over i a i okay and exponential e to the power minus beta e i right that's what my average is okay once i know this average so now the question is that just a minute yeah question is that how can i calculate this average so of course if i have if i am in equilibrium i have a boltzmann distribution right so if i have a boltzmann distribution i cannot just um, so the proper value of this proper average how i can calculate for this for for an ensemble which have n members so let's call it an okay that i actually have to write is in this fashion so sum over um uh, i is equal to 1 to n okay ai and now pi to the power minus 1 where pi that give me actually the probability which is proportional to the boltzmann factor okay so and then exponential minus beta ei divided by sum over i is equal to 1 to n okay pi to the power minus 1 exponential minus beta okay ei so so i can just change it to j it's a dummy in this is okay so that's what what this pi or pj that give me actually um the boltzmann factor okay so which is it's a probability proportional to the boltzmann factor so what i actually should do for an um, for a okay what i what i actually should do so i can say that the all the microstates have the same probability to appear in the system so if i put if i say all the microstate have the same probability to appear then my pi and pj they are okay this this in the top and the bottom both cases this pi they just become sorry they just become p okay and hence i can cancel them okay and then my definition of the average become like this okay so i actually have to calculate if i have to calculate the average that become like this now that's a wrong way to do this because if you are in equilibrium you know that the distribution is boltzmann distribution so you should pick up all the states uh following that boltzmann factor so i should pick keep this piece and now of course as someone said that i will put the boltzmann factor there okay so i will put then then for doing this average i is equal to 1 to n okay and then um, of course ai i am little slow for writing this okay and 
exponential minus beta okay and this boltzmann factor actually e to the power minus b e to the power minus beta ei by z so e to the power minus beta ei and it's to the power minus 1 so into z okay so that that that's this first this one and then then into z and then e to the power minus e to the power minus beta ei okay and then at the bottom sum over i is equal to 1 to n okay exponential minus beta e i z by e to the power minus beta e i so of course this guy and this guy cancels this guy and this guy cancels so and z in the top and bottom also cancels so at the bottom i only have sum over one um, sum over i um, uh, one to n and on the on the top i have the, that function so that give me basically that average of a okay which have the n number of ensemble member in the ensemble 1 by n sum over i is equal to 1 to n ai so so that's the normal that's how we normally we average right so the whole thing what i am telling that in an equilibrium whenever when in an in an equilibrium when i'm actually using i'm just taking all the samples and then just average over them underlying to that there is a fact that i am picking up all the states following the boltzmann distribution for following the boltzmann weight factor so if i do not pick up all the states following the boltzmann weight factor if in my dynamics of critical dynamics i fail to pick it up then i will not get the proper average and then i have to average either from this previous equation or if i actually sample it that way so if i depending on how i am sampling my average, the formula for my average changes so the standard if take the all the samples and then just average underlying to that there is a fact that we, you are, we are actually picking up all the sample following the boltzmann factor and this sampling is called important sampling this way of sampling following the boltzmann factor that's called important sampling So before going to the dynamics, I have to talk about, I just wanted to talk about how, how we actually sample it. Okay. Now the point is that we need a mechanism, okay, for the dynamics, which generating a new state from, from, a, from an initial state of the system in a random fashion, which using a transition probability from one state to another state, and these transition probabilities, if they do not depend on the previous, if they do not depend on the history of generating one state to another state, then this process we will call the Markov process. Okay. So the criteria for the Markov process is that they that the transition probabilities from one state to another that should not vary over time. And they should depend only on the properties of the current states of, of current states, say I and just its previous state say j and it should not depend it should not have any history dependent okay and now the transition probabilities okay i can all these transition probabilities say from state mu to state lambda so this transition probabilities from state mu to state lambda okay sum over all these lambda that will give me one okay so just on that let me just write down something now let me write down something which is called master equation okay so now let me write down for something called master equation so now this master equation when i am trying to write down this master equation let me just say that this master equation is called the master equation because it doesn't only give you the dynamics at the equilibrium at, uh, of a system which is at equilibrium. This master equation gives you the dynamics of any dynamical system. It could be in equilibrium, it could be non-equilibrium, stationary state, non-stationary state, doesn't matter. 
So this is a generalized equation which will give you the transition probability from any state, okay, which will talk about a differential equation, which will talk about transition from any state to any state, okay, in, an, in one single master, one single differential equation and that's, hence it's called the master equation. Okay, so let's, let's, let, let me write down this master equation. Okay, so let's, okay, sorry. What's happening? Okay, so let's call it. Let me write down the master equation dPa dt, which is say sum over um, b w b a. It's coming from b to a transition probability p b p a and p b. They are the trans uh, probability of the states and w b a and w a b. They are the probability of the, there is the transition probability from state A to state B, okay, W, A, B, P, A, T, okay. Now, this equation, if this D, P, A, D, T, that's not equal to zero, then I have a non-stationary state. If this is equal to zero, I have a stationary state. That doesn't mean that I have an equilibrium state. So now the stationary state, just just for the, if I write down the discrete equation, the, the stationary state, I can just write down the W sum over B, W, B, A, P, B, T is equal to sum over B, W, A, B, P, A, T. That's the definition of my stationary state, okay? So, and this stationary state, that could be non-equilibrium stationary state or it could be equilibrium stationary state. Non-equilibrium stationary state, one of the example is uh, this transport models, this TASE, totally asymmetric simple exclusion process where I have a current. Now, if I, okay, I'm just um, removing it here. So if I just remove the front sum over, that means, WBA into PB is equal to WAB into PA. That means stake by stake, this flux from each state to each state, the transfer of flux from each state to each state, if this goes each stake by stake, then it's in equilibrium. And that, of course, this in this case, this is, we write it in, the, in this term, that is T tends to infinite. Okay, it happened like that. Oops. It tends to infinite. And this equation is called detailed balance equation. And all my dynamics, equilibrium dynamics will be generated from this detailed balance equation now. Okay, now this detailed balance equation, I go to this detailed balance equation, and now this is the condition of the equilibrium, okay? And once I'm in equilibrium, I know that the, what is this, probability functions P A and P B that I know. And that's the that's the Boltzmann distribution functions. So this P A and P B is actually the Boltzmann have a Boltzmann is, is in Boltzmann factor. So in equilibrium I can actually write down the W B A into exponential e to the power minus beta E B is equal to W A B into e to the power minus beta E A. That's an equilibrium. Okay, this is the condition of equilibrium. This is the condition of equilibrium. Sorry for my handwriting because I'm not very habituated to write this on this. Okay. So this is principle of detailed balance and um, that give me this. Okay. So once I give this, so I can just write down the write down the um, ratio of this transition probabilities, right? WBA by WAB, that gives me e to the power minus beta. So B I I have, so EB minus EA. So difference between the energies. 
Okay, so now for, for equilibrium, I have these conditions. I came to this condition for equilibrium. Okay, from my little one, this is important. Now, so I can say that my bth state is produced from the eighth state only. Okay, and the relative probability of the ratio of these individual probabilities are this, what is written there. So as a result, what is more important, which matters is the, is the difference of energy. So which is important thing, which matters is the difference of energy, which is EB minus EA, and not the individual for the transition probabilities, not the individual energy of the state. Okay. So now, you see, this is arbitrary. Okay. So this, so I can say that any transition probability, any value of WBA and WAB is acceptable, the long it satisfies this equation. Let's call it this equation A. The long this equation A is satisfied, any transition probability value of this transition probability is acceptable. Okay. So now I can play with this. So of course, if I have more than one, two states, okay, so this will give me a transition. Uh, this transition probability will give me a transition matrix, a probability matrix, which will tell me the transition probability from each state to each state. Okay, so now I have the I have some freedom that I can choose this WBA anyway. The long it satisfies equation A. Okay, so if so, I can choose it this way. WBA that's equal to e to the power minus beta delta e. Okay, if delta e is greater than 0 and that's equal to 1. I just take the WAB, the bottom part, as 1 if delta E is less than or equal to 0. There is no, nothing wrong to do this, right? I just put WAB equal to 1 when this delta E is less than 0, less than or equal to 0, and then WBA, which is, which is actually given by the equation A when delta E is greater than 0. Why I do this? Because that make my algorithm faster. This is my algorithm for, for simulating equilibrium system. And that make it faster because whenever the energy decreases, I have my transition probability from going from state, uh, state A to state B, whenever the energy decreases with probability one. And whenever the energy increases, I go with a much lower probability to this higher energy. And that perfectly simulate my equilibrium state without any trouble because it satisfies by it's satisfied by the detailed balance equation and hence this algorithm is proper and this algorithm have a name and that called this metropolis algorithm so this is precisely the metropolis algorithm and if i have a more than two states then i have a transition probability and all these transition probabilities i have to write a down a number of equations of this detail valence equation, it will not be that simple. And for each detail valence equation, I can find, I can try to make most of the transition probabilities to be one and the rest of the transition probability will be given by the corresponding detail valence equation. Okay, this is called the Metropolis algorithm. So how I do this Metropolis algorithm for a real simulations? Okay, I take a random, okay, in Monte Carlo simulations, I take a random sampling, I randomly pick up a spin, then I let check the transition, if the energy is decreasing or not. If the energy decreases, then I put it one, the transition, I just flip the spin if the energy decreases for a spin system. If the energy increases, I put it according to this probability, it's one minus beta delta E. And then I keep doing it randomly for just which is following the standard Monte Carlo simulations. Once my L update is, once the update of all the spins on an average is over, I call it one Monte Carlo state is over. Okay, so this algorithm is called is not a it, it, it doesn't call a natural algorithm because I am making the system my, making my simulation faster for a single spin trip. Okay, and that's what the Metropolis algorithm is. And now, if you look at for the zero temperature dynamics, if I put the beta tends to infinite, then you see that the delta whenever delta e is greater than zero, that transition probability goes to zero. 
So that's why my zero temperature dynamics, if I have delta E less than zero, I put it one, and if the delta E is greater than zero, I put it zero, the transition probability. Okay, so this is, this is what the Metropolis algorithm is. Now, there is another algorithm, which is more natural, okay? So that algorithm, let's take, let, 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 let me take the transition probability in a different way, okay? So that algorithm have been taken mostly derived for, okay, that, that is a big derivation of that. I'm not going to the detail. So let's take me, let, let us take Ising model, okay? Because that algorithm have been developed following Ising model. That's Ising spin system in, an, in, a, in a heat bath. And so let me write down the Hamiltonian of the Ising model without the magnetic field. That is Ij, Jij, Sist. Okay. So now, of course, I can say that the, my transition probability, say W, for the ith spin, Si, S, and there is another W transition probability um, of some one state to another state. Say let's let's call it Wj and um, Sj. Okay. So is that something, it's a different state, is and is. So that's of course, P equilibrium of this Dr. is that, yes, please. Dr. Yes. Dr. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Soham, in that, in the, in the previous uh, example of uh, Metropolis, uh, mm -hmm. Is it the? I mean, I'm, I'm. I haven't seen much about the uh, metropolis, but uh, mm -hmm. does when it's equal to zero, does it has to be uh, one? Yes, that's how okay. I put it, right? Yeah. Because if if delta e is equal to zero, that e to the power zero, and that's of course one. Okay. So that that's why you mentioned that it's actually faster to yes. go to the okay. Yeah, because that's how I choose it. That whenever the energy decreases, I always put it one, and then let's see what the other transition probability come, and I put that formula there, and from the different detail balance equation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So now, if I go to this, this will happen. And now uh, there is a big derivation of this. Where, how will be the natural dynamics and so on? I'm not going to that. I'm just telling you that this equation. I can write it down this way. Okay, that's that's a hand giving argument, and that is given by Privman and Redner. They're in the book of Redner and Privman. Privman, no, 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 it's not Privman. It's Redner, Paul Krapitsky, and and perhaps Privman. I forgot. It's the it's the book of statistical on statistical mechanics of um, Redner and Paul Krapitsky. So the argument I'm going to present is their argument. So I can write it down that e to the power minus beta, okay, uh, s. Mm, uh, okay, let, let me write down that is i and this is si. Some i one, s j. This will be right. Okay. So, so this this will be then s j, and this is s i. Okay. So e to the power minus. Um, uh, minus S i uh, sum over i j j i j S S j and this is e to the power minus e to the power beta because uh, if one is positive another will be one is negative another will be positive okay just uh, following that because I have two different states, S could be plus one and minus one. And if this is a plus one and minus one stuff, so of course, if two spin are in the same stage, I will not flip. So they, they are in the different state. So, so I can just write down one positive and another negative. So Ij, Gij, and Sj. The same thing I will write. So once I write this, I can just, okay. Now I have this uh, e to the power a s, which is actually cos hyperbolic a plus s mm -hmm. sine hyperbolic a. 
so the same formula i am just putting it up here which me which will give me 1 minus si tan hyperbolic beta sum over j which fall in the all this group of i okay and j i j is j and in the bottom 1 plus s i tan hyperbolic beta sum over j fall on all this i j i j is j okay okay so just from that i can just pick up then that okay now my spins are spins flip with the conserving okay it's a spin conserved spin flip dynamics so my spin flips are like um the value of the spins are half so i can just write down the w i s that's okay again this is a very hand giving argument and that's not that's not how the original proof is the original proof is much rigorous using some uh, detailed dynamics and so on so tan hyperbolic beta beta sum over j that belongs to all i j i j which is actually the hamiltonian of the system so on so then i get this transition probability to be like that and this transition probability of the energy conserving um, uh, yeah for of the single spin flip dynamics of non conserved dynamics where the magnetization is not or order parameter of the magnetization is not conserved and this dynamics is called global dynamics okay so this is called global dynamics and now if you just actually calculate this in instead of delta instead of 10, 10 hyperbolic beta g i j you can write down the delta e there and once you write down the delta e there um, you can just calculate the delta e when delta e is less than one this whole function whole thing will go to um a spin if you put the spin half and then that will be half and one case it will go to zero and another case it will be just going to one okay so now so you see that whole thing of this come from basically the following the detailed balance equation and which actually mimic both these dynamics actually give you the proper uh, uh, the proper equilibrium dynamics okay now in the equilibrium dynamics i have few other things to calculate i need to calculate the few other things okay, what are the other things which is not only now i know that how what are the dynamics which is metropolitan dynamics and global dynamics and then then the similar way i just picked up the spin at random from from, from the lattice and then uh, if then i calculate the transition probability if depending on the energy is increasing or decreasing and then for the global following that transition probability i flip for a given temperature uh, and if the and, and for metropolis I, if the energy decreases i always flip it if the energy doesn't decrease i feel if, if the energy increases i flip it following that it is one minus beta delta e that's the whole thing and the temperature factor is there so i i i simulate the equilibrium dynamics in proper ways okay now all these things what we calculated there for the magnetization susceptibility um, uh, uh, magnetization susceptibility and specific heat is fine there are one more thing i calculate there which is called correlation functions so the special correlation function so oh, everybody know that what is the special correlation function look like so i am not writing the detailed formula for that but the special correlation function i can also write it this way si minus si average okay sorry oh, si average into sj minus sj average 
that's the way that's just the one way i can also write it so this basically tell me how so if i write it down okay of course there will be a omega i and omega j at the bottom but once i write it this way i can see from this formula from the top of the formula that it's basically tell me it basically it can it also give me some kind of fluctuations over the spin field okay and then for for writing this way we can use the field theoretical equations and can find out how this correlation function behave close to the critical point and so using the field theory what we get actually the how it behave is this r r is the basically i minus j r is equal to i minus j okay so r to the power d d is the dimension of the system minus 2 plus eta into exponential minus r by xi where xi is my correlation length okay xi is my correlation length and this is what it is so this is for any temperature okay so t not equal to tc this is for t not equal to tc or mostly for t greater than tc so it exponentially the correlation length uh, so it exponentially decay from one spin if the one spin is up what will be the probability that another spin at distance r is also up that's the correlation function tell me now you see there is a new thing which is new exponent new thing which is eta and that's another critical exponent okay that's another critical exponent this is also a static critical exponent but you have to find out doing the simulations and so on now okay so until this is fine now i say that if we are going close to the critical temperature that is for t tends to zero t is a reduced temperature that tends to zero that give me psi tends to infinite there's a critical uh, correlation length close to the critical temperature that goes to tends to infinite if that tends to infinite then i have this exponential zero it is the power zero so that that part go to this part go to one so at t is equal to tc that that t is equal to tc that gives me cr at t is equal to tc cr that goes as r to the power d minus 2 plus eta so at critical temperature this correlation length go as um, this correlation length go to go to the no um, give give me give me a power law and now whenever it give me a power loss so of precisely then for any dynamical systems or any crit systems where the critic where the correlation length when the correlation length start diverging close to the critical temperature then i have a criticality so the definition of the criticality changes and that's that's one of the reason it called the continuous stress transition because my order parameter changes continuously and my correlation length diverges Close, close to the critical point and at the point where the correlation length diverges and give me a power law the correlation function become a for for in form of a power law then i have a critical point and then the dynamics around that point is my critical dynamics and then and i gave this critical exponent eta new critical exponent eta also okay now let me go back to this presentation once more Okay. No. Okay. So now, okay. So now for now what I am talking about, so until after this, this correlation function and everything, we know how this algorithm and everything happens and how we do that. Let's go back to the scaling laws. So previous slide, previously to this slide, I gave you the scaling laws, which is here, 
which is basically you see that this scaling loss for this slide is valid for l tends to infinite okay so this is called the critical scaling now i am actually um, when we do the simulation we will do for the finite sizes right so then we should know what is the finite size scaling so for a finite system size of l so my correlation length that diverges as i told you that that diverges as close to as a function of the if the reduced temperature go to that so that is delta t to the power and how it diverges so it diverges as epsilon to the power minus nu where epsilon is t minus tc that's not the reduced temperature that's why i call it epsilon that's different because it's not normalized by the critical temperature so this correlation length it diverges close to the critical point and it diverges as epsilon to the power minus nu so that diverges in a power law fashion which is epsilon to the power minus nu and that nu is another critical exponent another new critical exponent what i get from the correlation length and there is another critical exponent i have shown which is eta that i get from the correlation function so this finite size scaling holds good if l is much much less than xi xi is my correlation length so that that means my parameter will be l by xi which is actually epsilon to the power nu into l so at the so the correlation function i wrote it here again that at t is equal to tc which is r to the power minus d minus d minus 2 plus eta where eta is my another thing okay so close to this critical point for the finite sizes i can write the scaling laws for different measurables i am measuring which is m magnetization xi the susceptibility and cv so m can be written as l to the power minus beta by nu beta is the previous beta nu i get it from the correlation length i define it from the correlation length and some function phi of epsilon l to the power 1 by nu epsilon i define it and nu is coming again from the correlation length and you remember that our parameter is actually epsilon to the power nu into l so the scaling function could be epsilon into l to the power 1 by nu okay the susceptibility have the similar functional form okay the similar functional form which is l to the power uh, gamma by nu gamma we defined it before nu is from coming from the correlation length and some other function phi into epsilon to the power l to the power 1 by nu and cv that is l to the power alpha alpha was again defined previously okay which is so so l to the power alpha by nu so all this critical exponent what i have previously defined and what i get from the correlation functions are here and the of, of the argument of or all these scaling functions are same epsilon into l to the power 1 by nu okay now these scaling functions phi xi and xi all these scaling functions they are valid for large l and close to tc and not only this scaling not only this critical exponents are universal these scaling behaviors are also universal okay and now this is valid for large l and close to tc why because such that this epsilon this argument of the scaling function epsilon into l to the power l to the power 1 by nu have a finite cut off value of its correlation length into delta t to the power nu that so that this cut of value it have so at t is equal to tc i have all this just the scaling functions that go to one and i get this scaling behavior like that so so on this now once i have the scaling functions for the finite size scaling i can again define a scaled magnetization scaled susceptibility scaled uh, specific heat and then i can plot this scaled susceptibility with the scaled variable which is epsilon into l to the power 1 by nu and that will give me a data collapse so for each scaling laws i can actually find out all this critical exponent using this data collapse now i have a problem the problem is here that i have i have one data collapse i have two parameter to play with nu and beta nu and epsilon gamma nu and alpha so all these scaling laws i have two critical exponent to play with to get the data collapse so none of these critical exponent values i can get it exactly that's a trouble okay of course i can get it exactly if i know the critical temperature exactly and that's also a trouble because how do i find out the critical temperature i know that the critical temperature susceptibility and the specific heat that diverges but i am simulating in a finite size so of course this divergence 
okay that will not completely divert that will give you a peak in the finite size and that well position of the peak will keep changing a little if you change the system sizes so that there is a trouble that i cannot still now give it give the gauge the critical exponent exactly or the critical temperature also and how to do that and exactly there what comes is the binder cumulant hmm? okay so now binder gave an idea of how to calculate to determine the tc and mu accurately from finite size system data now if i get this new accurately then you see that all the critical exponent i will get exactly beta lambda sorry beta gamma and alpha i will get exactly if i know new and tc so that's what the binder given uh, gave and formula which is called binder cumulant so this binder cumulant let me call it b which is 1 minus 1 third u and this u is m to the power 4 average by 3 m square average square okay so now now let, let's try to understand this is a little little carefully so for t greater than tc my u which is actually m, m to the power 4 it, it is a fourth order average of the fourth order uh, order parameter by the second order uh, second order order parameter square average of the second order order parameter square so m to the power 4 average by m square average square so if t is greater than tc so my order parameter will have a gaussian distribution right because it's it's completely disordered so if i have a gaussian distribution then i can play with the order parameter i can calculate this what is the um, uh, this gaussian distribution give me and that that is basically the fourth order fourth order cumulant by the second order cumulant second order cumulant square and that order parameter for a Gaussian distribution, that, that function for a Gaussian distribution, that will give me 3. One can calculate that for L tends to infinity. So, for L tends to infinity, for T greater than Tc, that Minder cumulant will be 0. Okay, so 1 minus 1. For T less than Tc, this you will be, and that, then you have a long range order. So, that you, you that, that fourth order cumulant by second order cumulant for L tends to infinity, that will be one. So I get the Debinder cumulant to be two third. So you see that then for if you go from T less than TC to T greater than TC, it's decrease in from two third to zero. So for a given um, for a given L, you will for if you change the temperature from T less than TC to T greater than TC, you change it, you take the temperature arbitrarily and then do this simulation for each temperature. And you plot the, uh, and you find out the winter cumulant, you plot it with temperature for different values of L, it will decrease from 2 third to 0. And that will be, give you one curve for different values of L, it will give you the different curve. And all those curves will cut in a point, which is your critical temperature. How? Okay, now I use the scaling form of the order parameter here, the, of, the, of, the, of the previous slide. If I just use the scaling form L to the power minus beta by nu, into phi uh, epsilon l to the power 1 by nu, if I put that order parameter, then I get a scaling function for the Binder cumulant. And that scaling function for the Binder cumulant, which is T and L, which will be what I have written, that is it, the argument will be epsilon l to the power nu. Okay? So I get the scaling function from the Binder cumulant, and from that scaling function, I, I can just see that if I put Tc, T is equal to Tc there, Okay, that scaling argument that becomes zero, and that gives you a constant. So this beautiful Binder cumulant one that gives you a constant value independent of L at t is equal to T C. So all this curve for different values of L as that have as that have a constant value for the at the critical temperature, they will cross each other each other at the critical temperature, and that will give you exactly the critical temperature. And now, for, if you look at the scaling function of Binder cumulant, there is only one exponent, which is nu. So if you play with that exponent, all this curve, changing this exponent nu for this, you, you have to basically plot the scaled Binder cumulant with the scaled variable. And you have to play, and there is only one parameter to play with. That will give you a beautiful data collapse and will give you the exact value of nu. So from just from the raw data, I will get Tc. 
and from the scaled data we doing data collapse i will get new so using winder cumulant i will get tc and new both and once i get both tc and new i can find out all other critical exponent beta lambda alpha everything okay sorry so this is on the winder cumulant the last thing i want to talk about is okay this until this is fine so i get so now i get i know the critical phenomena i get all the critical exponent exactly okay I, numerically i can calculate it okay i am i didn't go to the analytical calculations of the field theories so fine but so so i can um, i can get all this ex, uh, critical exponent properly using winner cumulant i know the critical temperature and everything so all these things are the critical expo critical exponent and i know the the um, global dynamics and metropolis dynamics and how these dynamics are work on th those are the critical dynamics for close to the critical temperature the temperature and so on so the last thing uh, okay so i know all this critical dynamics and how to do this critical phenomena and so on the last thing i want to talk about is something something different now how to simulate when when we are simulating there is one thing we should remember that each time i for a for a given temperature each time i sample a uh, sample a system whenever i take the value of a measurable and I, i and i go to the next time step and take another value of the measurable the state of these two time state should be independent if i do not have complete independence between these two state i am measuring then i am introducing some kind of autocorrelation between them which will mess up my average value so i have to calculate something which is called autocorrelation function at this autocorrelation function the autocorrelation between two state have to be zero and only those two state i can calculate so this autocorrelation function okay if Um, i guess you know the definition of the autocorrelation function so i am not writing it's just similar to the correlation function just it it tell you the correlation between at the state uh, at t is equal to 0 and t is equal to t okay at t is equal to t and t is equal to t plus tau okay so this autocorrelation function this autocorrelations that decay as t is equal to power t by tau that how it ex decays exponentially with time okay and tau is the characteristic time when this autocorrelation function is less than 1 by e so i have to calculate whenever i am calculating this autocorrelation whenever i am calculating these samples so this difference between the time difference between few states the states should be should be more than this characteristic time so i for in my monte carlo simulation i take one step and then i calculate this average i i can I, i can take the value of the observable then i throw out some of the monte carlo time steps okay such that the autocorrelation times uh, okay i throw out the number of time step which is more than the autocorrelation this characteristic time okay and then i take the another step and calculate and then all these steps i take the average over okay this should be done for any stationary state so i should not take each consecutive time step so i should take the time step between I, i should take one time step the value of the one time step and throw out something and then take another so that the autocorrelation between two these two goes to uh, zero okay now i have a trouble the trouble is when i go close to the critical point this characteristic time tau that goes as xi to the power z okay so you remember that close to the critical point my correlation length diverges and autocorrelation time that goes as xi to the power z so the autocorrelation time also diverges close to the critical point hence make it bit complicated to take two independent sample and as this autocorrelation time this characteristic time scale diverges that have a name this is called critical slowing down it happened close to the critical point and it's called critical slowing down and this z that is another critical exponent 
this z is another critical exponent and this is this critical exponent z this is nothing related with this all this static critical exponent what we have seen before and this is the called dynamical exponent this is called dynamical exponent and this is the exponent which is purely coming from the critical dynamics and this is nothing related with all the static critical exponent what we have seen before okay so this is the first dynamical exponent there are many i am not going to the detail of the other dynamical exponent there are other dynamical exponents another thing i just want to mention this close to the critical point at the function of that also goes as t to the power minus lambda okay it, here t is the time and this lambda which is the autocorrelation exponent that's also another dynamical exponent okay so uh, yes so this is this is all for the time uh, for now and now there are let me just mention the other thing so this metropolis dynamics and uh, this global dynamics all these things we get it from the detail balance which actually give you the proper um, uh, proper algorithm for simulating the equilibrium now if you want to study a non equilibrium system a non equilibrium dynamics for the spin system like quenching then we the then we need an algorithm which actually can give can simulate the equilibrium properly and then we put that algorithm for the non equilibrium systems as we know that algorithm can turn, uh, can can simulate or sample the equilibrium properly we will just go to that uh, use that algorithm for the non equilibrium dynamics which will which we know that will will take the system in equilibrium in a proper fashion and then we study them all these kind of things of um, of this um, autocorrelation functions how that decay with time uh, how this dynamical exponent changes okay how the domain growth um, persistence and all these things just one warning that there was a confusion in the scientific community for some long time that this dynamical exponent and the domain growth exponent which we also call z the value of this z is close to okay this value of this dynamical exponent z is close to 2 okay it's not okay so they are the same thing or not they are not okay so now that's why we call that z as domain growth exponent and this as dynamical exponent barkema with some extensive numerical solutions he have shown in some of his papers that this value of z is little more than 2 the last value i remember it was 2.016 for the spin system and dimers and all these things 2.016 plus minus 004 something like that yes plus minus 004 so he is one of the person who have shown that this dynamical exponent and the domain growth exponent they are different because for the domain growth exponent is exactly 2 okay because for a spin flip you can model you can map that spin flip to a um, random walk problem and from the random walk problem you can exactly solve that the domain growth exponent will be exactly 2 for in one dimension at least also it's true for the higher dimensions but this dynamical exponent that's actually coming from the critical slowing down which is different from the domain growth which is related to the domain growth but different okay and that value is close to 2 but exact not exactly 2 um so and now once we know this algorithm we can use it for different kind of things in uh, in econo physics and many other things and uh, in wikipedia page uh, when they talk about this critical dynamics and uh, the algorithm for the critical dynamics the only one single example they told in the wikipedia page that where this dynamics for the non equilibrium dynamics this algorithm is used and that's sociophysics <laughs> that's funny okay and now for the critical dynamics there are many other things for the non equilibrium dynamics which is uh, one of these non equilibrium dynamics is called non equilibrium phase transitions one of the example of this non equilibrium phase transition is active absorbing phase transitions active absorbing phase transitions 
So there you get many other um, than exponent, critical exponents, which is not related to the static critical exponent. They are the dynamical critical exponents for this acting absorbing phase transition. There are many other things like extra transition. There are many other things like explosive percolations. Okay, um, okay, this one of okay, explosive percolations. So percolations and then Sanpai model. Explosive percolation is more like an Ising model of the you know, non-equilibrium phase transitions. This acting absorbing phase transitions, explosive percolations, and 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 Manna model for the Sanpai model. And the last one of the thing which comes later on is is also cellular automata. Okay, for non-equilibrium dynamics, what we mostly look at is the domain growth. So there is a domain growth exponent and autocorrelation exponent, and much later which come is 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 persistence also. So yeah, that's that's all I had to say.